Hi everybody and welcome back to the channel. In today's video we're going to learn how to make mullen tincture. So I'm beside a really great mullen that I have growing in my uh, medicine garden. And mullen has been gaining kind of a lot of popularity in recent years because of its amazing respiratory support. And of course, this time of year we have forest fires out west. So mullen is a really great ally for the lungs. For more detailed information on how to identify mullen and all of its medicinal properties, I'm gonna encourage you to please check out this video up here. This video that I'm filming today is only going to be on how to make tincture uh, with mullen. So I'm gonna preface this by stating that I attended Living Earth School of Herbalism. The director's name is Michael Vertoli. And this is how I was taught how to make mullen tincture. This is the method that I still use today because I find it to be very potent and it works well for me. If you ask 100 herbalists how to make a tincture, you're going to get 101 different answers. So if this method doesn't resonate with you, that's okay. Find another video that works well for the way you would like to make your medicine. Um, also, please, before you make mullen tincture, again, just check out the video with the Materia Medica information so that way you know how to use it and why you're harvesting it. So when I make tincture, the ratios that I'm looking for are 87 grams of herb material to um, for a 500 milliliter bottle. And again, this is the ratios that I was taught at Living Earth School of Herbalism. I will link that school in the description below. So when I'm harvesting mullen, I am looking for, as you can see, a flowering spike. It's got quite a few flowers open and more that will be coming. You want to make sure that the spike is still pliable and flexible. Okay, do you see how it bends really nicely? And it's already starting to bend. It's got a nice arc and curve to it. Oof. So I'll actually grab those flowers too because they fell off the spike. If the spike, one, if it's already finished flowering, you don't want it at this point. And if it's no longer pliable, it also means that it's nearing the end of its life cycle. So I'm going to harvest the entire spike from this. And like I said, it, the medicine and in the inner core of the spike is really potent. And so some people will only take the flowers. Personally, I love this method. So I'm gonna use my scissors. There's no way you're getting through this. I'm just trying to break it off. So make sure you bring a good pair of harvesting scissors with you. And I'm gonna go right below this last <laughs> bit of flowers. And I'll put that in my basket. And I'm also gonna pick up uh, all, the, uh, all the flowers that maybe fell down that still look good. Now for each spike, I'm going to take one of the best looking kind of basil leaves. So mullen has these really awesome, big, fuzzy leaves. The further down you go, they're starting to get a little bug-eaten, kind of brown. So I like the look of this one. So I'm just gonna go in there again with my scissors and take one leaf to go with the flowering spike. So the rest of the process we will do inside in the herbal apothecary. So I'm back in the kitchen and I'm about to make my mullen tincture. Uh, and for those who are curious, the botanical name is Verbascum Thapsis. And I'll make sure I write that below because those can sometimes be a little cumbersome to say and remember. I also want to point out that the process that I'm using here and the way that I harvested the herb material is for tincture making only. When I am using mullen or Verbascum, in the terms of infused oils, I do not take the flowering spike. The water content in the flowering spike is just far too high. And so when I make infused oils with mullen, I will pull the flowers off and I'll harvest the basil leaves. I'll let the leaf wilt a little bit. I like to use fresh herbs when I make my herbal infused oils. And I actually have a really great guide on how to make herbal infused oils on my website. So I'll link that below too. But because the water content in the spike is so high, you're almost assuredly gonna end up with a rancid end product. So the process of harvesting the spike and one large basil leaf is really for making tinctures only. So again, those ratios that I mentioned, 
Uh, if you want to make a 500 milliliter tincture, and I've always just used mason jars, there's just a few things to keep in mind, which we'll talk about when we get to that point. Um, if you want to make a one to five herb to alcohol ratio tincture, you're going to want 87 grams of herb material. If you are okay with making a one to seven, which isn't quite as potent, um, then you're going to need 63 grams of herb material. And if you plan on making tinctures on a regular basis, it's really wise to invest in a decent little digital kitchen scale. I bought this one probably 10 years ago for $30. I've had to replace the batteries less than a handful of times. So it's really one of those things that uh, it's a good investment if you really want to get into this kind of work. Now, lots of people will also just follow more of a folk type method where they'll fill their jar you know, two thirds of the way and that's okay. But I am a clinical based herbalist. So because of that, I like to be pretty exact. Again, those ratios come from the school I attended, which is Living Earth School of Herbalism and I will link that below. So let's get started. Um, I wanna preface that the minute you start chopping your herb material, your plants are exposed to oxygen. So this is not, you don't wanna start this process then walk away and go like wash the floors or take a phone call or something. Like you wanna make sure that you're being mindful and that you work as quickly and efficiently as possible. I love using a mezzaluna. It makes the chopping work so much faster. I get questions about using food processors often. Um, personally, I don't use them. And the reason I don't use them is because I find that I have a deeper connection with the plant that I'm working with if I chop it personally. Um, so I'm not saying don't use a food processor, do what works best for you. Just ensure that you're not pulverizing your herb material, which is a real possibility with a food processor as well. So I'm just gonna start chopping. And you want your herb material to be in fairly small pieces because this is going to expose um, the herbs, like there's a larger surface area that's exposed to the, uh, the alcohol. So, and also it won't fit in the jar <laughs> if you don't chop it fine enough. So I'll just get started. I usually start by chunking up the spike. And those ratios that I mentioned, the 87 grams, that is for any tincture that you're making. So this process can be used um, as long as you're harvesting your herbs appropriately, um, you know, can be used for any plant material. So I like to chunk up the spike first. There we go, break it into kind of smaller, more manageable pieces chopping the leaf as I go, and then I get to work. And like I said, a mezzaluna just makes this process, whoo, flying mullein flowers, <laughs> uh, so much more efficient. So as you can see, I'm chopping this fairly finely. Now tinctures will store with the herb material still in them for years. Some folks will even say decades. So I don't press my tinctures until I need them. So that's one of the reasons why I like to work in 500 milliliter jars. I could easily, you know, make one liter at a time, but the minute I press it, I find that my tinctures will last about a year. And I don't always go through a liter of all of my herbs in a year. So. I like to work in 500 milliliter sizes. When I was first starting out and only treating myself and my family, I was making tinctures at 250 milliliters. So, you know, use what works best for you and your family and your needs. If you're a clinical herbalist, you're probably going to want to make more if you're in practice. But if you're just supporting your needs and your family's needs, you might not even need 500 milliliters. So it's chopped fairly fine at this point. I'll get my husband to zoom in one more time so that way you can have an idea of what I mean by fairly fine. My teacher always said that if you've chopped your herb material sufficiently enough, it will fit in your jar. If it doesn't fit, then you're gonna have to keep chopping. These wide mouth funnels work really great with uh, the 500 milliliter jars. It makes it easier uh, to put your plant material in. So my menstruum of choice is 30% alcohol and 10% vegetable grade glycerin. That combination pulls out a beautiful range of both water soluble and fat soluble constituents. Again, you're going to get a lot of varying opinions on varying alcohol percentages for different herbs. 
it's different strokes for different folks. You know, you work, use the method that works best for you, what you have access to, what feels good to you. For medicinal mushrooms, I would definitely use a higher alcohol content, but because of this, I use the same menstruum for every herb. Some herbalists would never do that, right? And other people just go and buy vodka from the store and use straight vodka. There's nothing wrong with that. If you don't have access to vegetable grade glycerin, that's totally fine. You can definitely just use vodka, which would be about a 40% alcohol ratio. So I have my herb material chopped well, and I'm just gonna pour in my menstruum, i.e. the alcohol. And I fill it up all the way to the top. So as I was mentioning, when we use mason jars, we have to be very cognizant of the fact that they come with metal lids. So I always use a parchment paper barrier. So that's gonna prevent the alcohol from corroding the metal. Because once it starts to eat away at the lid, um, you're gonna notice like little black flecks. Your medicines become contaminated at that point and you're not really going to want to use it. So I always give it a really good shake. You want these to sit for at least three months. They can sit, as I mentioned earlier, they can sit for years, years and years. I have some tinctures that are almost 10 years old and they're perfectly fine. Resist the urge, don't pop the lid. You know, every time you open it, you're exposing it to oxygen. So you want, if you're using clear glass, you do want to store this in a cool and dark location. So that way it's not exposed to a lot of light. Above your stove, definitely not, gets way too hot. And some herbalists would say you also want to store it away from electronics as well. So the next step, which is really important, is labeling your tincture. So when I label, I like to write the Latin name. That's me personally. I also write the ratio at which, if it was a one to five, a one to seven, and the date in which I made it. So verbascum, Thapsis. Today is the 4th of July. Happy 4th of July to my American followers. And mine I made was a one to seven today because I didn't quite have enough mullein and I didn't want to chop another plant. So I label it. Some folks like to put where they harvested it. Um, in this case, most of my plants at this point in my practice come from my garden, so I know that. Again, you're gonna store this in a cool and dark location and you're gonna press it when you need it. In terms of pressing tinctures, it would be another really great wise investment would be a potato ricer. These things are awesome. If you can't afford a tincture press, especially hydraulic tincture presses that start in the thousands of dollars, my potato ricer has actually served really well. It kind of looks like a giant garlic press. And so that way I pour the herb material through and I'm able to squeeze out as much of that alcohol as possible. You can squeeze by hand, but you're losing a lot. It's amazing how much more you get from your potato ricer. And then I'll run it through a second strainer just to get out. And especially with mullein, because the leaves are so fuzzy, I'll get out any of those kind of little hairy bits that were left over at the end. So thanks so very much for joining me on this video and learning how to make mullein tincture. For those who are watching this a part of the tincture class, all of the ratios that I talked about in this video are in your lessons and your handouts. So refer to those, print them out, make sure you hang on to them. Again, if you haven't seen the video on the actual medicinal properties and why you would want to make mullein tincture in the first place, I'll link that up here. Check it out. It's only a five minute video, but it's full of great information. If you have any questions or comments, please leave them below. And until next time, this is Corrine from Spirea Herbs, wishing you health and wellness.